Good evening, everybody. It's my first online talk, and so I'm always a bit nervous, of course. And today we want to go to the Botanical Garden of Tübingen, and the title is Working with Alpines in the Botanical Garden. And as a subtitle, it's more than cultivation, because it's not just the ordinary garden work, it's it's much more. And first um, of all, because we are so international, no one knows where Tübingen is. So I help you a little. We are just here in the center of Europe. And if we go a bit closer, you can see Italia is quite typical. And you will see Tübingen, the southwestern part of Germany. And not far from us, about three or four hours drive, we can reach the Alps. So a little more focus in, you can see Stuttgart, that's the nearest bigger city, and Munich is about four hours from us. Stuttgart is half an hour drive. Um, there is also an airport, so you can reach us by plane, if you like. Lake Constance is not so far, and down to Austria and Swiss, Switzerland, you can see the Alps. So quite often I'm there um, because I like the mountains, I like nature, and so it's good to have this all close by. Also the Black Forest and the Swabian Alps is not so far. So the Swabian Alp is built up of limestone, so we can source limestone. And the Black Forest, it's more acid stone, so we can also have this. That's quite comfortable for us. Not everyone has this possibility. Now we go to the garden. That's a picture, an old picture, just after opening in 1969. Um, yes, you can see the greenhouses, the systematical part in the middle, and also on the right-hand side, that's the rock garden. At that time, it wasn't so nice, or it, it was the style of the time. They didn't build large rockery. It were more flat beds with some rocks and alpine plants. And this is a quite new picture. If you want to see more of our garden, our collections, you can go to our website. And there you have some pictures and explanations. Um, but today we want to more focus on the Alpine department. On the satellite view, on the left-hand side on the bottom, there is the rock garden. It's about, I think, 3,000 3, square meters. And on this picture, you see some divisions. There are two main divisions. The lower part is for the plant societies of the Alps. So there are regions with limestone and others with um, more granite and gneiss. And also the subalpine flora is shown there. But that's not the part where I'm working. I'm working on the other side. This is the geographical part. There we have plants from the whole world. We want to show the diversity. And so there are many, many subdivisions there. And also I'm responsible for the Alpine House. It's close by and it's quite new, about 20 years now. Let's go a bit through our rock garden, through my part of the rock garden. This picture is the, the winter time. And you see the yeah, this garden was built I think it was in between 89 to 99. They built um, walls of rocks and yeah, it's not the best style, but at that time it was quite modern. They built um, walls on the northern side to get some softer sloops to the south. And in the beginning there were many, many rocks, but some plants has really good established. Most that we have to do, that's gardener's work. It's things like reading, watering, and so on. And today we want to talk too much about this. I show you just some pictures um, from last spring with some good established plants like this Havalea. It's quite happy on the northern side. It's self-sowing and it reaches dimensions dimension you can't really have in a small garden. Other parts like this, it's more the Mediterranean part. We have Globularia repens. It's covering all the stones like a carpet. And I like it much more than the European um, Cordifolia. It has much more compact cushions and pale colors. Globularia Cordifolia has the much better color, I think, but it's it's very vigorous in our garden and um, in some places you, ch you can just keep it beside the path so that it's not overgrowing other plants. Another picture from autumn, yeah, it's a view to the south faces of the Caucasus bed. 
And um, yes, you can see some, some Akantolimons, they are quite happy here. And in my eyes, it's not what I really like. So if we jump more in the summertime, you see how green it can be. And it's a lot of weeding and jobs like this. And as I have to work all day in, I'm not so happy with everything. And I want to transform it in something I like more. And so that's what I'm doing sometimes, transforming the rock garden. Well, one small job can be to do some top dressing with small stones. That's what I want to show is here on the, uh, I think it's the South Africa bed, just the soil is, is covered now with small rocks and pieces of rocks and give a good, good mixture. Or here some added limestone, a bit like crevices, yeah. And some plants like this Carix firma from the Alps, it likes it a lot. I think it's growing better there than on the pure soil. During summertime, we have to water a lot. Um, I think we have about 700 centimeter, uh, 700, 700 liters of rain during summertime. But as the summers are getting drier, we have to water a lot. And so we water also the weeds. In some cases, you have just to rebuild some parts. Some parts are about, I think, 30 years or older now, and it's time to do this. Also, what you can see, the old style of building was rows of large stones and not so much smaller stones in between. First of all, we have to convince our technical manager and normally they agree to support us with money and give us the chance to do this. So first we take out all rocks with our old machines. That's quite good if you can reach the stones. Some are quite heavy and in some cases, of course, you have to do some handwork. So if it comes to the ground or closer to pipes, you have to shovel and do things like that. But I get help sometimes from some colleagues. And if you move away the rocks and big blocks, you find one of our main weeds, Equisetum. It's everywhere under the ground. It was there before the garden was installed and it will still be there when the garden will be gone, I think. So we have to struggle with this a lot. What helps us just a little are these layers of textile that we put on the ground and it helps a little, I think. We can't get it really out. Um, in some cases, when this textile has um, little holes or things like that, and the equisetum is growing through, um, we use sometimes some herbicides seeds to push it back and it, it's quite okay. Yes, the rocks were stored beside and as we want to move to another style of, of rock structure, um, we need more stones and it's good that we can source sometimes stones um, um, from a close by merchant who's selling these rocks. This type of stone, it's a sandstone and it's very hard. It's red sunshine in German. Yeah, it's really a good stone. I like it a lot. It's, it's good to work with. And some, some rocks are really good to use for the new rockery, but some are more like huge blocks and don't have a nice face. So I decided to make smaller stones of them and um, by drilling it didn't work so good. As I learned, um, yes, I got education as a landscaper some years ago and worked there in a company. So I tried to do it with old style tools. So with an axe and a sledgehammer, we, we smashed the stones. And if you follow the layers, because sandstone is a sedimental stone, so you have layers um, and cracks. And if you follow these layers and hammering on the X, you can break it into slices and get good rocks or good things for crevices. At the moment, uh, this is from springtime. We haven't finished it. Um, yes, I hope to do this soon. After you build the backbone with the large stones, you, you are filling the places in between with smaller ones, filling the gaps with sand. And that's a picture how it looked after springtime this year. Yes, then we had to go on with the weeding and the normal ordinary work. And last week it was covered by snow, so 
work couldn't start. So I hope next week I can start again. Snow is gone away. But I want to switch to this part that we already changed and we changed it to, into a crevice garden. What's in my opinion, a good thing to grow alpines. So this is, uh, I think from Caucasus, Caucasus flower, flora is represented there. And it was re rebuilt, I think five years ago, but the picture is a bit older. So there are not so many plants. One terrible thing in botanical gardens, you see it immediately, are the white labels. I don't like them so much, but we have to label our plants. If you look from the other side, you can see the layers there and also the, the top dressing in between the larger pieces of rocks. And that's a picture from the building of the crevices. Yes, it's looking like a lying wall in my eyes. <laughs> But we wanted to follow the layers and so it was looking like that. But it's not the right angle to, to look on a crevice garden. You have to change and don't look through the layers. You have to look from the other side. And I think it's coming out quite good. And yes, the plants like it also. That's the biggest thing about everything um, when we build this. Also, I think we don't need to water that much when we use crevice style garden. One plant I took away from the America bed that is at the moment under change um, is this Eriogonum. And it's much happier in this, yes, in this bed. And I will plant it in the, on the right uh, geographical part as soon as possible. So now we switch back to the overview because I want to go to the Alpine house and to the Dionysias we are having there. And another picture from winter. Alpine house is necessary because some plants need the rain cover. Yes, if, if you are, if you like alpines, you know it. There are some nice, more nice, more or less nice um, alpine houses in other places. And yes, also Gothenburg has a quite new house. We were there some weeks ago and they built a large QFA arrangement inside and it will be open next year. But our house, it's not that style. It's a more practical house. It's not the fancy style outside. We focused more on the inside. Um, the house is about 12 meters long, four meters wide. And we have this mono pitched roof at the highest point, it's three meters high. What's going to the north and to the south, what's we are, what we are looking now, it's about two meters high. There's a shading inside, so we can also protect the plants from too much sun. And we focus more on the inner parts. The right part was built up of acid stone, different types of granite gneiss, also some porphyr slices. And on the other side, we built a large tufa wall. In the inner structure, there is some metal to keep the Tufa um, slices together. This picture is from the start in 2004. And this is a newer picture, much more plants and in flowering time, it's quite attractive to look at. Um, and some plants have really good established. Yes, for example, this Daphne Asminea. The left one picture is just after planting and on the right hand side, you can see it's reaching now over a meter in diameter, so it's quite big. Other plants also good established. So Corridalis or Pelargonium are quite happy. They are also self-sowing on the ground. So sometimes we have to weed them away or give the other plants some more space. Here is the first Dionysia, Dionysia involucrata, one of the easier species of Dionysia, and it has long stems and on the end you find the flowers and later the seeds. It's also self-sowing and also on the ground and on the tufa. On the right-hand picture, you can see um, somewhere here, there is a seed pot. I placed also the seed pot there. And if you put the seeds into the small holes there, they are, can germinate and give really good and hard plants. And it's better than drilling holes or something like that. Dionysia iranica on the northern side of the wall. The right picture is from the dormant time in 
yes now at the moment and when they come into flower it's really a big show to see these flowers and these huge plants the visitors can't go inside the house so from outside everything is visible so it's good to have large windows and no visitors inside one special Dionysia is Dionysia Afghanica as the name says it's from Afghanistan and it's only one clone of Dionysia Afghanica in cultivation, this one. And we also planted it inside the house. There are several plants. This one unfortunately died, so I'm not so happy with it, but there are others. And for sure there will be some new larger ones in the next years. And from Dionysia Afghanica, there are several nice hybrids. So this one was a spontaneous um, occurring hybrid on Michael Kammerlander's Tufwand, Tufa wall. And so it's called Tufawand Tufwand MK. And we want to show these um, hybrids on this wall. And there are several young plants now. I think it needs some time because they aren't so fast growing and they will make a good show. As the doors are open during whole the year, um, also some snow can come inside. And some plants like this Dionysia aritioides can be totally covered by snow. But they don't care that much about it. If it's just during the winter rest, it's not that problem. During summer, they need to be protected from rain and water. And yes, if it's in wintertime, sometimes happening, it's not that big problem. Dionysia aritioides is also one species that is self-sowing. And what you can see here on the left hand side on the top, it's a self-sowing hybrid that spontaneously occurred there. I took a cutting and potted it up. It's not the nicest one, but you can see from the color of the flower that it's a hybrid. No one knows what's inside. During flower time, we have um, many pollinators, or not so many, but there are some bees, some early bees flying, um, wild bees that can pollinate the Dionysias. Also, this is a spontaneous um, hybrid that was just occurring on the other side of the Tufa wall. Also, this um, yes, washed colors, but it's a nice cushion. I also took some cuttings and put it, it I gave it a, the name Nerd because it's on the north side. And as not everything is self sowing, we switch now to planting in tufa. And in the beginning, when the tufa wall was built, we had no propagation for own plants. And so we had only larger board plants. And so the holes had to be bigger. But it takes a lot of time until a cushion can cover such a hole. So this Dionysia curviflora, I think, um, hasn't still covered it. And there are really there are many old holes, um, so I switched to plant some faster growing Dionysias. This is also Dionysia aritioides or Dionysia batsoftica. It's also faster growing and they can cover these holes as after three or four seasons. You can't see the large hole anymore. But I switched to small holes, so this is what we are doing now, drilling small holes. This, I think it's eight millimeter and we are drilling downwards in different directions from one point, and so you have space in the ground, in the rock, and you have to place small rooted cuttings in the small holes. So this Dionysia microphylla is uh, a, a slow growing Dionysia. The hole is filled with sand. When you put in the cutting, you fill in sand and wash it inside the hole so that there are no air pockets. The second picture on the left hand side, it's, I think it's after a year when the first new shots come. And so the Amicia microphylla, the slow growing can also um, cover these holes. The hole on the top left, it's for watering. In the beginning, you have to take care that this young plant doesn't dry out. So. I also drilled holes to water the small young plants. Another new planted one is Dionysia cervestanica. It's also after one season, yes, one centimeter, 
but it's faster growing and can cover such holes. And I think after four years, this plant, it's looking very natural. And I think the roots are running out of the drilled hole because Tufa has a lot of holes, natural holes, and the roots can run in there. The holes that I drill, they don't go through the Tufa into the back. They are just in the rock. On the other part, the acid part, I also tried to drill, but when you ever worked with some rocks, you realize that some rocks are harder than others. So drilling in granite isn't very nice. I also tried it and tried it with Dionysias to plant them inside Dionysia Tabletotis. It wasn't that happy at this place. I think it died after two or three seasons. In other parts where crevices were built, Dionysia Tabletotis grew quite well. And others also like this Trafelium Asperoides in some porphyro slices. Yes, but when you're working there every day and you don't really like hold the ridge, you sometimes decide to take it out. And that was the conclusion that I came to. So I decided to transform the Alpine House as well. And it's not so easy if you have an installed Alpine House with glass aside. And we moved out the rocks with help of this extension, self-made extension by our, by our mechanist. You can put it on a fork and then with the wheel loader, you can reach inside and take out the large blocks that are much heavier than sandstone or, or tufa blocks. And then you come to a stage when you think, oh, what, oh my God, what have I done? Nothing is inside and where to begin? But it's good. It's, it's a good start to see this and to start from you. So first step is again sourcing rocks and as we have close by the Swabian Alp, where you find Tufa, we have these stored rocks from the beginning of the Alpine house. But because they were there for several years, they are very mossy and weed were on them. So you have to clean them with high pressure. And after cleaning, they look quite like new stones. Yes, you can't take away everything. Some weeds are still inside some seeds and Sometimes we have some weeds that come from the time before the cleaning. And when you start to build, you have to start from the ground. So the idea was to have the possibility to bring in water into the new tufa. And so there was this hose installed under the path. On the right hand side, you see it's covered again. So there's just a little piece of the pipe looking out. And as always, not everything goes like you like. So when I drove by the house with the reloader, I touched the roof and got a million of diamonds and new experience. Yes, it wasn't really good time. Um, yes, you, you have to stop the work and arrange the things. We have to cover the house and wait until someone would fix it. But it gives you time to, to do other things. So whilst the other work had stopped, we built the path from yeah, where the, the, the pipe is lying down. And we built it from limestone, pieces of limestone to make it in a crevice style so you can walk on and you can also plant something inside. Only if you have guests, they are allowed to go inside and normally the plants aren't harmed. When I'm watering, I have to walk through the house and pay attention on the ground. And finally, the window came and we saw small rocks and brought them inside. I drove carefully, more carefully, not to touch the roof again. And then you bring everything inside, leave enough, enough space to work. And it's always the hardest to start. Yeah, but is the goal what where what you end with the work, but well, well um, how to start with it. So after the start is done, it normally goes a bit faster. So side walls are built, the inner part is filled with soil and sand, and you build from back to the door so you can drive in and bring in all the material you need. And that's what it looked after all the rocks were placed. 
And then the final step is the top dressing. And I think it's one of the things you have to focus a lot because the fine top dressing gives a connection to the pieces of rock and it gives you one piece of rock after finishing with the fine work. Yes, and that's what it's looking now. You can see in the foreground um, the two ridge, uh, the ridge with the two peaks. The idea was to follow the main peaks of the back, and also the idea was to come higher than the um, the windows in the in the front, so you can see the plants that are a bit more um, closer to the visitors. To other views, you see also the top dressing and also the first plants are on. And yes, it's it's one thing now. It's it's one ridge from the start to the end. And from the inter trans, it's looking like that. And it's now one thing, not too much uh, disturbing different stones, different type of stones. It's a small place, so I think it's better to just use one type of rocks. And also there are now some Dionysia moved in and this, because of that we are now moving to the Dionysia collection. After we had decided that we want to grow more Dionysias, we needed a greenhouse, so someone else had to put out his plants and we prepared the house for our style of growing. So with a lot of help from Micha Kammerlander, who is a very good grower for the Unusias in Würzburg. He helped us a lot with good advice, how to build the tables and what we have to think about. And he teach me a lot about taking cuttings, labeling, a lot of things. I have to thank him a lot for what he told me. And also he helped us with plants and cuttings. Um, yes, he's a nice guy and is very helpful. So after some time, the house is filled with many plants, many young plants. Yes, that's picture I'm not so proud of because that's the more, yeah, that's how it looks when I'm working in. There is no more space left to walk almost. So yeah, it's a working place sometimes, not just a collection house. When the plants come to flower, it's looking quite beautiful and. That's one reason why I like Dionysias. They are early flowering and it's, it's springtime before spring begins. I just to show you some pictures of, yes, of some plants we have there. Dionysia curviflora, for example, or Aretioides. Dionysia Aretioides is one with the nicest smell, I think. And Dionysia prioides, <clears throat> Iranian plant. And this is Dionysia batsoftica. Yes, we want to take together as much different clones um, that are in cultivation as much as possible. And because it's a scientific um, collection, it's important to have the correct labeling and the most important is the right name. So when the plants are flowering, we give it to our botanist and she is de um, determinating the plants. Also what's on the label is the acronym for the collection, the collection number, JLMS. So for example, this was a seed collection in autumn by four people in 2002 at the collection point 87. It is in the Sacros Mountains somewhere. This gives reference where the location is that was collected. The next thing that's on the label, it's in this that case MK2. It's Michael Kammerlander, a seedling that he raised at his place. So um, it's also important to number the different clones in the collection. You need this because individual plants are different. And for the Unusias, it's also special because you have different types of flowers. I go to this quite quick now. Here you see from, that's uh, the short letters for from, what means it's a previous stylus flower, what means that the flower has a short stylus. I will show this on some other pictures. Whole the thing is important for the collection so that we can really see what plant we have. And if you just write a label with a name, um, you don't know what clone it is and you can't have a good overview over the diversity of the plants. I switched to the thing that I mentioned about the flower style. The Dionysias have different types of flowers. You have plants with longest stylus flowers or called pin. 
our previous stylus flowers. If you look closer to the flower, you can see on the left hand side something is reaching out. That's the stylus. On the right hand picture, you can't see it. So this is the pin that's reaching out. And that's the short style flower, previous stylus. And if you cut through a flower, you can see what I mean. There is the stylus on the left hand side. It's the long style on the right hand side, the short one. And there are the places for the pollen, the antheres. And in one type of flower, you have the stylus reaching out and the um, pollen is inside. And the other type of flower is the different kind. I want to mention this because it's important for the pollination. If there is an insect, um, it takes the pollen and transfers it from one type of flower to the other type of flower because the pollen is on the one type um, of flower inside and there it's tapped to other, other point of the insect than if it's going the other way. And so if you take the pollen from a previous stylus flower, it's placed on the longest stylus style, yeah, on the longest style. So normally in nature, you need both types of flowers that there can be a natural pollination. And so it's important to mention this also on the labels. And you can, of course, try to do a pollination artificially. It works not so good, but it works. You can do it with the hair from a broom or something like that. I show you here Dionysia viscidula. It's an Afghanian species, and it was only once collected, and there is only one clone of this flower remaining in cultivation. And I'm showing this because, yes, Dionysias are wanted. And as we don't know much about what Dionysias are in collections out there at private collections, we can have a focus on the collections in botanical gardens, but we don't know what private collectors have. So I'm always looking for someone who has Dionysias at home to know what, uh, what Dionysias are there. And if these are clones that we don't have, perhaps we can exchange plants and bring some new plants to our collection. So now a switch to the propagation of Dionysias. I don't want to talk too much about the plant things. But I think it's important to know because propagation, it's the key for me to keep the collection going. If you want to propagate a plant and keep the plant as it is, you have to do it in a vegetative way. This, it, that means you don't take seed, you have to take cuttings. And at first you need a good plant in a good condition and the right time to, do it, to take the cuttings. The best time is after flowering when the plant starts to grow again. Best is part to take cuttings uh, there to the rim or here close to the label. There you you have longer groove and these are yes easier to take. And sometimes you have also also roots there um, on some single row sets, so you can pot them immediately. If you take out cuttings, you need good tools. So fine scissors and a pair of good working tweezers. And then you can cut out a long piece of the mother plant. And you have to isolate one of the rosettes with a short stem uh, or keep the stem as lo long as possible. But if you can see the stems are not so long, you need to tap it all this. It's okay to work with um, and to propagate, but if you go to Dionysia's Afghanica, it's much um, harder to get a good um, a good cutting, but it works. And as my eyes aren't the best, I use this thing. Makes me look really good. And you need this to take away the brown dead leaves that are on the stem. This is a cleaned up cutting. You have to be very careful when you work with this. Don't break the stem and yes, handle it carefully. Don't touch the place where you cut the, the piece. If you touch it, you can shorten it a little with the, with the scissors and just cut it a little. And then you transfer it to the right medium um, for cuttings. For me, it works best with this fine pumice. It's it's uh, pumice sand. It's better than just sand because pumice has little holes inside and can take water inside. And if you have watered it once, it keeps a lot of moisture inside of the single combs. And with sand, you have little pieces of rock and there's no water inside. The better point is that you have also air into the medium. The water is inside the comb and not in between. 
you make a small hole into the pumice <clears throat> and then after placing the cutting, you water it and wash the pumice around the little stem. But one thing that I have forgotten, um, if you take the cutting with your tweezers, just take a leaf. You can squeeze one leaf that's dead after you work with it, but um, don't take it at the stem because it's really, really soft and you can bend or break it or squeeze it too hard. Yes, and in that kind of way, you can make a lot of plants. From one single plant, you can just have a lot of clones. So every plant of this um, after one label is it's identical, genetically identical to the plant before. And it's not so easy to source plants um, but the long-lasting tradition in botanical gardens is a seed exchange. And seed exchange, it's going back for well, so a long time. Um, I go through our collection of seed lists and found some interesting ones, really old ones. Yes, from different botanical gardens in Europe or the right one is from, I think, St. Petersburg. So there was a really, really international exchange for a long time. And it's very good to have these also from Edinburgh, I found one, and also one from Tokyo. And yes, it's it's an ongoing process. And the good thing is it's out of political or ethnical things. So it's a good work we exchange with many botanical gardens. I think we have about 350 botanical gardens in the network. And so we can source seed from almost whole the world. One of our winter works is also to work in our seed exchange. We also collect seed in our garden, put all what we got into the seed list. A winter work is, a, um, yes, is cleaning the seeds with sieves and whatever. And I'm also a bit more involved in sorting and storing and things like that. It's good to have a system to bring it into order so you can find everything later um, and in all during the winter time I think we we have about 4,000 seed packages that we send to about 170 or more botanical gardens yes it's a lot of sorting taking out and filling and yes many steps until you can get them to the post yes it's a good source for new things but often you have just um garden collected plants and because in gardens you have plants from whole the world seeds are tending to help hybridize and not often you yeah, sometimes you find hybrids and don't get the true species but you can't get something interesting so for us it's also important to do field trips excursions visits and some of our visits also take us, took us to England. Uh, I was a bit shy to bring in these two pictures, but I want to mention just these two guys, Nigel Fullers, who passed away some weeks ago, also Hans Kaupert last year. They were very friendly. We visited them twice and it was very nice to talk to them and the exchange of experience and good advices they gave me. Yes, it was nice to be with them and it's sad that we don't have them anymore. Yeah, just some pictures to remind them as well, but they were really good growers. When we were at Nigel's place, I saw these plants on, yes, this is Dionysia Isfandiari that we collected and he propagated them. The plants look much better than in my place and yeah, I was happy to see this. When we went to England, we also met Eric and Paul, perhaps they are also today with us. Um, Eric Cherrigan and Paul Ranson are also some of the really super um, English growers. Um, and they also helped us with, with good advice. And it was very great to meet them at their place, see their plants. And I realized that I never, never, never re reached this level what English growers um, can reach and never have such plants. I, and Paul also took me to a show. I never seen a show before and it was amazing to um, see this. And also Paul and Eric and others gave us plants. There are a lot of people in our network and also 
a good thing was to go to the Czech Rock Garden Conference. Yes, it's good to go to such events to get connections all over the world. There are many, many people that helped us to get new plants and we also are in exchange with them. But um, as regulations and laws and things like that are getting harder and stricter, it's more and more difficult. Um, the plant community, it's, it's a really good thing and it's a way to learn from everyone and uh, I think it's a big family. Yes, and if we can't do exchange with other peoples, we have to do some other things. We have to go on really exciting trips and one of the best was to Iran. We had two times the chance to go to Iran and Iran has two main mountain reaches, the Zagros Mountain and the Elbos Mountain. So we went to the Zagros Mountain, where is a hotspot for the Indonesias. The main distribution is in Iran, Afghanistan, some are in Iraq, also Turkey. Around this region, you find some. And for me, it was the first time to see Indonesia as in nature. And it's a good experience to see and learn from nature how plants are growing and perhaps learn about their demands. And here you see the Dionysia Lamingtonii, that was my first Dionysia in nature. Yeah, it's it was very, very great. It was super. Um, also, we had a permission from Tehran University to collect um, samples of plants. And we did this by cuttings. Yes, I tried not to disturb plants, so always I took small pieces up to 10 little rosettes from a plant, not to destroy them. It was flowering time, so you can't collect seed, but it's easier to detect the plants because when they are in flower, you see the yellow spots, you can find them with binoculars very easy. And we also wanted to visit this place. We had the information about Dionysia robusta that was discovered in 2014 and at the location where the plant grows um, we couldn't find it but on another spot close to this waterfall we found yellow cushions of this Dionysia and after determination it came out that it is Dionysia robusta. It was interesting to see at the, that stage of the year you have a lot of water and the plants were growing also inside the waterfall. What you can also see is that there are different layers of stone. Some is really hard. There you can't find the plants only in crevices, but in the softer layer you have a lot of flower plant, <clears throat> a lot of plants, a lot of large cushions. Also there we took some cuttings, and yes, we filled our trays. I think with about two thousand, two and a half thousand cuttings. The result was five hundred rooted cuttings. What? Yes, what was quite good because um, taking cutting in flower times, uh, it's not the best time to do this, but you have to do it when you're there. So it worked quite well. And so it was um, good to bring Dionysia robusta also into cultivation. I hope I can spread the plant a little more and that it also will reach other gardens. I also brought it to Gothenburg and perhaps we can bring it also to England with some, yes, some paperwork, I think. And that time when we were there, there was a lot of snow and I think I will go to Iran as soon as possible again, as soon as the situation will be better there, the political. And there are so many spaces, so many unexplored spaces because botanists are normally quite comfortable. They drive up, um, to a pass road and then walk 500 meters beside and don't go further. I, I'd like to hike there and find perhaps something else. But what I do, I go to the Alps as often as possible. Um, and I do it with work sometimes. We are going on field trips also to the Alps. This picture was taken on a trip with the DAV, that's the German Alpine Club, but it's more for sportive things, but they also have a botanical um, weekend. And so since five years now, I'm with them as a botanist, I'm a gardener. Uh, yes, I'm with them and help them with the plants. And it's a good possibility to see different regions of the Alps. 
And when you're walking there and looking around, you you get good impressions how nature, yes, how nature is creating um, crevice gardens. And you need these images. You have to keep them in your mind to transform it into your own garden. And when you see how good the plants are growing there, this Fitalma hemisphericum, for example, it's good to get impressions from nature and to bring them into their own garden. In some cases, cases it's strange what you find there. Nature is also creating very accurate things, but you can see it as a artificial way. I like these mountains. I like the difference and yes, the transforming what the geological movements are doing, it's impressive. Here we have um, Selenia Acaulis. I think it's quite common in, in the Alps and also in other parts of Europe and to the northern part, also in England, I think, also in America. And in my opinion, it's looking different. Perhaps botanists should, should focus a bit more on this species. Sometimes on the picture on the left hand side, um, you have Selenia Acaulis also. You find seeds on them, and also we collect seeds in nature. Also, Androsace helvetica um, sometimes has seed, and if you have some tools with you, you can collect them. It's yeah, sometimes it's easy, but sometimes not so easy. But for me, it's always good to see how the plants are growing there. Androsace helvetica it also belongs to. Primulaceae, so it's the same family like the, the Dionysias, and every time I find them, I, I think it's the Dionysia in the Alps. I like them a lot, but uh, Androsaceae is not so easy to grow here because it's too hot. Um, they need more cold conditions. I have several young plants, but, but they aren't that good growing. Yes, what I try to do is to, yes, to plant like in... I see what I well, what we find in the Alps. So the Dionysia on the left hand side, it's in a pot, and yes, there it's a little crevice style pot. And I think the plant is good growing in this situation. Get images from nature and transform it or do it in your place where you are. Yes, and in the Alps. As often as possible, I'm there, and I'm, I think I'm a mountain guy and like it a lot. I like to hike with my girlfriend, Molly, and so I hope to go soon as possible again to the Alps, and that's the end of the talk. Thanks a lot for everyone. If you want to contact me, you can do it by email or just come around.